Karakaran. And, and thanks, thanks to, to Kiara for kind of allowing me to see Singapore for the first time, and thanks for having us here. So, my name is Robert Farrell, as um, Chris said, and so I'm going to talk about clear based testing and finding more bugs with less effort, which sounds pretty good. I work at a company called Ambiar, that's how I say it, um, and I've been doing property based testing for the last three years, pretty much in some sense exclusively. So, I kind of, I've really been thinking about it up since that time, and I kind of want to pass on why I think it's a really interesting way to test, and how I think it's a better way to test, and why I think everyone should kind of be looking at it as, as what they should be using at work. So, so I want to start to talk by you know, asking the question or you know, posing the question, what's the point of testing? Why, why are we here? Why do we think testing is useful? And then in some level, I think it boils down to wanting to write the right software, correct and reliable software. So that we write the code, we commit it, check it in, push it to production in some sense, and have it not break us, have it not blow up the user face, and actually have it produce the correct outcome. So, so testing is often that first line of the test. You've written code, or maybe you haven't written the code, and you're, you're running that test to make sure that you, you get the answer that you think. And also then, over time, make sure that that test picks up any regressions or things that break. So I kind of want to, you know, really kind of ask the question, is testing giving us what we think it's getting? Like, are we getting enough out of it? Are we, you know, are we really finding all the bugs that we can find the bug before it hits production? And I think the answer is no. One of always. And I want to talk in, in some ways about when I talk about testing at the moment, I'm talking about example based testing. So the idea here is that you know, we kind of capture this one thing, these, these particular arguments of this function will return this particular output, and that's it, that will capture that one thing. But the, the hard part is how do you work out what an example should be? You should know about the function, know what edge cases to look for. Well, I kind of want to tease this out with some actual code. So I'm, I'm using Scala as the code here, but the, the point of this is definitely not about Scala at all. So this is actually the substring function from Java or the JVM, but it could be in any it could be in any language. Most will have some way to take a string and reduce the length. So let's say we've written the substring function and then we want to then test it. So we write an example. So we write if you if you take A B C and you pass in one, you get you get B C. And then maybe that's not enough. So then we add another test to make sure that the length the length check is correct. Maybe we actually check that the Unicode works the way that we expect. Maybe we, we give it big numbers, maybe we give it small numbers. And I guess the question is, how many examples are enough? Like how, when do you stop and say, that, that function now works, so we're never going to have to add another example ever again? Um, and, and I know as a developer, I'm not very good at this. I know that, you know, you know I, I think I've tested this code enough, should it's fine, and of course it doesn't, it doesn't work, or you know, the QA guy comes in and breaks, breaks the hell out of your, your program. So, um, I, guess the, I guess the thing is, like, if, to write a really good example test, you really have to know, I think, about those edge cases. You have to be looking for them, you have to know what you're going to hit, and make sure that you test like, both sides of the edge case. Instead of us coming up with these examples, why don't we get the computer to do it? Why don't we get it to kind of effectively generate a whole bunch of these examples and then see what it can find rather than us having to do it manually? So let's rewind way, way back to 1999-2000. So this, this paper came out and this library came out called QuickCheck from Colin Carson and John Hughes. So it's been around a long time. And the idea here was that you would generate these examples and see what you could, you could prove or you could check about your programs. And we'll, we'll see about that in a second. But let's talk about John Hughes. So John Hughes is the, one of the two authors of, of the QuickCheck library. Uh, and since that time, since 1999, he's gone on to then found a company, I'm not going to try to pronounce this, <laughs> um, and they basically test software for a living. They go into organizations, and, and I don't know if they do, but hopefully they get paid lots and lots of money to find bugs in software that, that people have tested but can't quite break in the ways that they can. So I want to talk about the, the best example from their website, which is the, the one where they went to Volvo, Volvo paid the money to go in and actually test part of the software to see what they could do. And so in this particular case, they were testing this sort of bus system of passing messages around the car, talking from the stereo and the brakes and all sorts of things like that to see what could happen. And they have the different parts of the car being outsourced to different, to different suppliers. And there's a whole bunch of code here that they that they've written from these different suppliers. And so when John Hughes' company went in, they, they basically wrote a whole bunch of quick check error, a whole bunch of properties, and they found a whole bunch of uh, bugs in both not only the actual supplier code, but also like in the specification itself. So not only was the code bad or, or broken in some way, but also that it was never going to work. Like the specification was just wrong. 
So, so the, the other one, that, of sort of the well-known property testing library you may have heard of is, is the one called Yefs. So it's, it's written and, and sort of maintained by a guy called Carl Kingsbury, and he writes an amazing blog that's called Call Me Navy. So if, if you're using any of these databases or distributed systems in production, I highly recommend you go and read one of them because it's, it's fascinating what the analogs and edge cases you find. So it kind of uses property-based testing in a sense to, to kind of throw, you know, spin up one of these systems and then test it in crazy ways. And, just, and basically almost all of them are broken in some ways that people didn't expect. And so I like this one in particular because it goes to show that you know, Carl has basically become a kind of standard for it. If you have one of these systems, it's a badge of honor to have Carl on with your, you know, your, your product, your, your software, to actually make sure that it works the way you think it does. So people are taking this very seriously now. Okay, so enough about motivation. Let's talk about QuickCheck. And since 1999, QuickCheck has now kind of spawned, has become kind of usable in pretty much every language I can, that I can think of. So there's 31 languages on the Wikipedia page. But let's have a look at sort of how it works and what you can do with it. So I'm probably using this term incorrectly, but the idea here is um, with fuzzing, the idea that you kind of randomly generate data and throw it in your function or your system, looking for performance or security bus. We're not really looking for any of those two things in particular, but let's just look for ways to break that function, for a habit to throw exceptions, have it just not work. So let's go back to our substring uh, you know, example before, and let's just look at one example. And let's ignore the, the output. We don't care whether it actually works or not, we just want to make sure that it doesn't break. Okay, so this is the you know, this is where we start buzzing. So we need some way to generate a string. I mean, maybe just call some sort of random string function. Let's do it in a way that we can kind of call it over and over again. And so in Scala check in particular, which is the Scala derivative or one of them of QuickCheck, it looks a little bit more like this. So the idea here is that you pass it a way to generate a value, so like generating some value A, and the callback function says, you know, here's a whole bunch of these random values, see if you can make sure that it's correct or not. And so now that we have this for all function, we can then, you know, the standard libraries of property testing will sort of provide a way to generate random strings, but have ways to, to randomly generate this. And so now when we combine these things, we can see that we're, you know, generating a random string and we're generating a random int, and we're just going to see what substring does. And if you've ever used a substring function on Scala or Java before, you'll know what's going to happen. It's going to block pretty quickly. And it's going to block because the, the, you know, the, the integer, the offset is going to be greater than the, the, the actual length of the string. So, so for now, I just want to ignore that and say, OK, well, we know that that's not really a problem. Let's add a, let's add a precondition to say, well, just ignore anything where the integer is less than the string length. And this is a, this is a way to sort of say in Scala check or, or uh, pre-check, um, this is a precondition for the function. So, so it's going to break again, basically, in a very simple way now that we're going to generate so integer is less than zero. So in fact, not only is it, you know, if integer is greater than the length, it can also be less than. So let's, let's sort of update our precondition to say, OK, if the string is, make sure that you do less, you know, greater than zero and less than the length. And so finally, we actually get a, a you know, the yeah, okay from, from Scala check that in fact your substring function is not going to blow up, assuming, assuming that precondition. So we'll, we'll see all of these examples over, um, you know, in the next couple of slides, but I kind of also want to call out what's beautiful about this is we found two, two, you know, edge cases effectively without knowing anything about a substring, having never used Java before, we saw that it blew up two different ways just by running a very, very simple property, very simple fuzz. And also what's really wonderful about this is now that we've written this, if we, we have, we're going to have more confidence in this function. We don't have to change the test. We can just crank up, crank the lever for, we'll run this, run this a thousand times, run this you know, ten thousand times, depending on how fast the function is, depending on how important it is. You can, you can use the same property, the same files to really crank up the, the times that it runs. And maybe this, maybe this finds a bug. Or maybe when it runs in the Google loop three weeks from now, it finally generates an example that blows up. But this is, this is where things get a bit tricky. So that was all we were with fuzzing. We can just throw some arguments at a function and see where it blows up. But this is where, you know, I remember when I sat down with property testing, I got to this point, and things got really, really sort of annoying. Because you end up in this situation where you generate your arguments to input, it's not throwing exceptions, but how do you actually assert that it's doing the right thing? And I always guarantee if you try to do this, you'll, you'll do this. You'll, you'll, you'll eventually write substring again. You start going if length is this, and then do this thing, call this other function, and you eventually end up having two implementations of the same function. And this is not really the point, or at least it's not always the point. And there are better ways, or there are kind of tricks that you can use to kind of tease out the good properties. So I want to call out some sort of, some really fairly well-known property design patterns to help you kind of go, well, this is the kind of function, this is the kind of thing I care about, this is how I should write a property test for it. So the first one of these is the idea of a round trip. 
So let's say we have a function that goes from some data type to a different data type. So in this case, we're going to take a string and we're going to convert it to bytes. Maybe convert it to the UTF-8, and then taking those bytes back in the end, there should be a way to go back to the string again. There's just sort of a way to go to and from the data type in some fashion. So if we look at it in code, this is the exact thing I was just describing. That in Java, there's a way to go to bytes from a string, and then there's a way to go from bytes back into a new string. So we're going to write a tricking test. It really couldn't be any easier. We're going to say, generate a random string, any random string, call to two bytes, go from bytes back again to the string, and that should be the same. If these two functions are incorrectly, they should be the same. But that's actually not true. Of course, depending on the operating system you're running, depending on the locale that you set, um, the language you set, you're going to get some cases where certain UTF-16 characters are going to then not, not be sort of, you know, reversible. I always want to tweak the test slide just to kind of make this more obvious, which is in fact what we could do is write a property to make sure we're testing with this character set. So let's not only randomly generate the string itself, but let's also randomly generate the character set to see what happens. And then that will actually tell us more that's this is this is sort of what's going on. So we can see that some character sets for some strings are going to break. Now obviously this isn't necessarily like, in fact, this is pretty much how these how these functions are supposed to behave. But again, Knowing nothing about this function, knowing nothing about the internals of it, we did a basic edge case where we now know something about this, which is we should be very careful about what encoding we use if we're ever following this function. So if we were following this within a function within a function, we would suddenly find a bug where, depending on the character set we were using, we would hit something where the user might not see, you might see the question marks rather than something useful. So this is just something we need to learn about the functions that we're calling. So let's, let's now test you over time, which is a, a Java library for you know, date manipulation. So we're going we're gonna to randomly generate a date time. We're going to try to test the, the date format. So we're going to basically print this, this date to a string and then ideally pass back into the same, the same date. And I tested this, this was a couple of years back now, but I uh, used to block with this error, basically going, well, can't, I can't handle passing with a with sort of time zone bar. So, so again, this was just a fixed um, since I tested it. But the idea here is that, again, I knew nothing about the other time or anything at all, but just writing a tripping test, I was able to kind of work out the error bugs in the system. And the examples that they were using in their test weren't good enough. So, so I do a lot of JSON encoding work. I do a lot of you know, serialization over HTTP for REST. So often we'll have functions that go from user type into some sort of JSON representation and then come back again yeah, to, to the actual original data type. And again, the tripping test is basically writing itself, which is to JSON from JSON should be the same. Now, uh, this one can certainly tell you about some more code. So let's say you're encoding it in some way in terms of the, 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 the strings in some ways that don't line up. But I think what's more important about these, these functions we're testing will be the actual edge cases of the JSON library. So the JSON library that we're using it didn't handle the microsecond precision of the dates. We didn't know that, but when we start testing the properties, you can suddenly find this out. So this isn't all just about testing, round trip testing, pure kind of quick code. It can also be code testing code that's actually doing like database stuff. So, so let's actually call the database. So let's insert a user in the database and then let's look it back up again. We should be able to write a tricky test that pretty easy. So let's insert the user, get it out, and we think it's the same. So um, apart from getting the bugs in your code, maybe it's written correctly, but once you get past those things, you also start to learn things about the database that we're testing. So if you've ever tested the Postgres SQL before, you may or may not know that it doesn't like null characters. So when, it, when you try to pass a string with a null character, the null characters basically get stripped out. So, so again, not necessarily bugs, it's just an implementation detail of Postgres, but we, we, we learned that just from writing a tripping test. So to kind of, kind of bang on about it just a little bit, like what I love about this kind of style of testing is writing really you know, two line bit of code to kind of go to and from a particular value, you start to discover not just the bugs in your code, but the bugs in the edge cases in the systems you're calling and the libraries that you're using. So the second uh, style that happens is the one of the test oracle, which is kind of what I was talking about when you were rewriting things, but this is now much more intentional. So let's say again we have a function that goes from a string to an int. And let's say we have another way to go from that string to an int, a different, different path, a different code, maybe, not, maybe unoptimized, and now we can then assert the answer that these two functions will be the same. So in some ways a contrived example would be that if you ever have to write a sorting algorithm ever, you should be writing a, 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 an error based test. So let's pick up on the team sort function. Uh, this is, I have no idea how it works, but it's an implementation of the Java sorting. And then let's just write a really simple uh, Oracle-based test that's saying our sorting for any array of these, the sorting of team sort should always be the same as bubble sort. Something really slow and horrible, but something that we can look at the code and go, we know that's correct. And this is a, this is a bit of a long stretch, but there was actually a bug in the team sort algorithm in, in Java for very, very large arrays. And it, you know, it's just probably 
you know, this was wasn't our property based test, but you can imagine a world where if you paint the linear up high enough with this, with this particular test, you can eventually get this edge case. You were never going to write an example that would find that. So again, let's, let's go back to the database style stuff. Let's see if we have a query that's going to uh, look up users from a table and, and all by name. The Oracle based test in this case is a very, very simple operation on, on the list in memory. So we're going to insert a whole bunch of users into the database, and then we're going to call our list by user function to kind of retrieve the user from the database. And now the Oracle in this case is a very, very simple list manipulation. So we're basically modeling or kind of recreating what the database is doing just by this sort of way. So um, this is certainly, um, oh yeah, and, you may, and you may find, you may find bugs, you know, your relations not done correctly, or your database doesn't behave in ways that you expect, you may sort of see bugs here. So this is, this is a poor example, really, but the idea here is that, again, if anything's not working the way you expect, this test will tell you. So the, uh, an example from my past is where we were using, uh, we, we had our own data representation for performance reasons and, and past path reasons in Hadoop. So we actually had our own data representation like this. So we wrote to and from your time functions that we can go from our daytime to your time again. So this is just for testing. And we had a, we had a tripping test for that. So we said, well, just make sure these, these functions aren't broken so that we can rely on them in other, in other cases. So where things get interesting is that I eventually have to go and write a day plus function. So they can give it a day and some number increasing or minus by, by some, for some offset. So I only had to write one test. I just had to write this one. So I generate a random date, I generate a random integer, Plug them into my function, and then as long as I go to Yoda, use Yoda's you know, plus A function, which is being well tested locally, and then it works in, in more cases, and then you go back from Yoda back into our date format. And then, even if I didn't know anything about date time formats, you know, this will tell me pretty quickly if I've done something to you, but it will tell me about uh, you know, calendar leak years, it will tell me about all sorts of things. So even if I don't remember the line of code, this particular test will tell me everything I need to know. So I love Oracle based testing in particular for, for finding these bugs, you know, finding, you know, basically covering all the edge cases that I need to and then just keep, keep running it over and over again until I know that my function passes. Another point here. Um, so you, the, the Oracle based testing is particularly good in cases where if you've ever taken like a, an optimization path, it's easy to get faster if somebody do something a little bit silly, if you know, mutate this thing here, make sure it looks quicker, you now have a free Oracle based property. If you're ever talking to a database or to a file system, you can also then write an Oracle based test because you can recreate those things just with a simple just format you know, manipulation. So another kind of thing to look for when you're writing properties is if, if the function you're writing is, is meant to be unimportant, that is if you sort of run it twice, you should, or, you know, you should get the same result if you run it more than once. And so, and I do apologize, this is not a very good example, this is just the one from the previous slide, so calling this thing twice on the list should give you the same as calling this thing once, like you shouldn't change the order the second time, you shouldn't drop it dollars. That, that seems pretty relevant. I actually struggled to find a really good example about this, but I went hunting for bugs on GitHub. So I looked for the word out of my own on GitHub and came back with 4,000 issues. Maybe the one I was doing, I suspect some of them are, but the one that I like uh, was this one. So it's not a serious bug, but there's a tool called Rust format. So it takes the source code in Rust, and if you run it, it will kind of format it, correct, you know, format it in a nice way and make sure that it's always consistent. So here's, let's have a run it once and it produces this exact bit of code. So ideally if you run it again, it gives you the exact same layout. But of course the bug was that it would start to re repeat the attributes in, in certain cases. So what I like about this bug was that someone then raised another issue going, well, you know, maybe we should have a test of this. That, that would seem important. But they, got, they came back and said, well, we do test it. We test against so all these hard code examples that we have in our code base. What's wrong? If only there was a way to kind of get more examples. If only there was a way to generate more examples. Uh, and then uh, also an interesting thing that style format has the exact same kind of problem. So obviously, formatting code is obviously something that's hard to run, get it right with other codes. So a property makes sense, just may or may not find this kind of works for you, but I think it probably will. I still haven't found a good way to describe this style of pattern of test. This is sort of a thing that's kind of a general approach when you're, when you're trying to test um, certain kinds of functions. Uh, but hopefully the example will kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So let's, let's come back to the, the substring example. Like I said, this is really hard to test, and it is. If you just generate the string, you just generate the integer, you're going to have a hard time testing this function without recreating the substring. The trick here is not to just use those arguments. The trick is to generate all that you need to then sort of manipulate the arguments so that you know exactly what the answer is going to be. So what you can do is you can generate two strings. You can generate two strings so that you know that the second string you generate will be the answer. And then you can work back from that and say, well, actually, let's just pull off the first string and then you can add them together to get the, the input. So, kind of just sort of make sure that people know what I'm talking about. If you generate like A and B, C, 
the length of that is one, substituting that off will then leave you with the answer to these So the trick here is kind of, if you ever kind of find yourself writing a property and you're just generating the exact equals to the function, unless you're doing like a round trip test or a Oracle based test, you'll probably need to do something like this. You'll need to generate more information than you need so that you can then manipulate the arguments to pass into the function, and you'll often then need to know the answer. If you find yourself recreating logic on the right hand side of the equal sign, you're probably not generating enough of stuff. Okay. So, so the last of the kind of the patterns here is sort of the, the where you really kind of try to assert certain properties out of your code. So you, you're running over a function and maybe the, maybe the order of the arguments changes, but there's a certain property that you want to kind of maintain. So this one's a bit harder to describe, but I want to show you a really interesting example. So we're going to test the lowercase function. So we don't want to necessarily recreate this function from scratch, but what we can say is we think that if you call to lowercase on a string, the length of that lowercase string should be the same as the original string, you would think. But, but this is actually not true. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I mean, I'm really bad with stuff. I would have said that, of course that's true, but in fact, there are, there are certain strings where if you do lowercase some of the, you know, the, the, the number of bytes in the string will then get decreased because of the Unicode glitz or, or whatever it is. So again, you know, this is a assumption I would have had about, about a particular lowercase, but writing it there and saying, oh, this is really important for the code, this is really important for how it's going to run, you might find uh, bugs in your, your code, or, you know, the functions that you're calling. So, so this leads on to a, kind of the second aspect of property-based testing that I really love, which is the idea of shrinking. So the idea is that you know, once you've, you know, once the property testing libraries generate these, these values, finally found a case of action gross, gross exception, all the assertion is not true. Uh, but you do it, then kind of work, it does more work for you to work out what those, those actual values should be. I'll show you what I mean. So if we go back to this low, two lowercase example, you can imagine if we naively implemented our own property testing library, the same thing you find a, you know, an error or assertion or a bug, you might just stop and say, well, you know, here's your error. So you can imagine it actually doing this. So of course it's going to generate the bigger and bigger and bigger string, because eventually one of those characters will be that, that character that, that doesn't quite, um, you know, two lowercase in the same way that we expect. And there it is in there somewhere. But now you have to go, now you have to go looking for it. If you run it again, you're going to get a whole different error. And somewhere in there is only one character, or maybe that's the problem. So, so the beauty of shrinking will be that most property testing libraries will then do this. So it'll hit this error case, it won't then throw an error, but it will then start to work out, start to shrink these generated values into something useful. So they'll actually see this kind of output. So you originally found this error, like after you know much effort to generate this big string, but it then starts to kind of you know halve the string in half, and then when it finds one of the stars breaking it, you know, it's hard just, you know, until it finds that one character that's causing the problem. Or maybe it's a combination of characters. But it will kind of do the extra work for you to tell you this is the bad example. And it's pretty hard to explain kind of how this works without trying to code, but I just kind of give you a feeling for it, which is let's use property based testing to find the smallest uh, odd number. So we're just going to set all integers that are even, which is not true. And so, you know, scale check will tell us all that. I found this really big odd number, and then I eventually came back way back down to one again. So to give you just a quick idea, just kind of a quick visualization of how this might work, you can kind of stick the print and so now we can start to see what's happening, which is that you know, it's generating all sorts of crazy values. It eventually gets a lot number and test effectively fails, but it doesn't stop there and just keeps you know, coming back to zero, you know, getting a bit bigger, getting smaller, until eventually kind of, you know, not quite binary search its way back to, to one. So this is it's doing all this extra work to kind of say one is the smallest value of this test and it doesn't work. So shrinking will become useful, or I'll, I'll mention shrinking again later on in the talk when we're talking about state-based testing. So, so I want to talk about the other side of property based testing now, which is not the, the properties themselves, like the assertions, but the, the other really important part of it is generating these, these, these values, which is a really critical part of the property. So we can start back to our example again. We had some sort of insert user function, and we're going to look at the test that it works for insert Bob. So let's replace this with a with the property testing and say, okay, well, let's, let's try you know, fuzzing it effectively. Let's fuzz it with a whole you know, sort of random strings and see what breaks. And then, of course, we actually have validation on the username saying, well, our username can't be blank. So we had a previous uh, a property saying, okay, you know, ignore those user strings that are, that are blank. And then they also say, well, hang on, you also can't handle the fact that your username is contains spaces. So then you add another, you add another precondition, you add another precondition. This is this could go on for a while. Maybe, maybe the strings that have the usernames are really, really specific. And so this eventually will actually give you an error from, from your property testing library going, well, I gave up because what's happening here is I'm generating so many random values and nothing of them is actually getting through the test. You're wasting your time just burning CPU. Which is actually a really handy feature so that you don't have tests that literally sit there forever. 
So I don't want to go into any detail because I could be here all night explaining it, but it's a whole bunch of, depending on the, the, the property testing library you're using, these might be annotations in, in Java or Python, these are the particular functions of Scala, but it doesn't really matter. But there's ways to kind of build up these generators. So in this particular case, I'm going to combine the use of the gen with this one function, which generates a, a list of at least one value, and then it chooses what I say, given these two values or integers, you know, generating any value between A and Z, like lowercase string. So we're saying you're basically and our names have to be a lot of string between A and Z, at least one, or one length. But, but let's, let's not stop there, because this might actually be true for all usernames in the system, which is exactly what we want. So let's extract a useful function from this. So we're not just going to have this in, in the one particular property. We're going to extract out a gen user function that we can then use across the code base. So then, as we test, delete user, update user, you know, migrate user, every possible function that ever needs a user, we can never use this one generator. So we're kind of Reaping the benefits of having sort of one, this one function that tells you this is what it's name means, this is, the, this is the, the biggest edge cases we can think of. And over time, as users grow extra things like, let's say we add an age to our user, let's say we add user settings, you, know, you can then just change your user generate function and you put it in one place, and then all your other, all your other properties are the user and then reap the benefits of that. So I want to tell a funny little story um, um, about, um, you know, sort of a story from my history where we had, at the previous company I was working at, we had a bug where uh, for a particular customer, the database migration failed on a particular username. And eventually, after a couple of days of tracking it down, we worked out the problem was that one of the users had the last name of null. So, it's a Who knew? So, you know, we did what we, you know, what we normally expect. We, we fixed the bug. We wrote another, you know, test regression case saying, well, you know, make sure we migrate the user with null since so it never happens again. That's great. That's what you should do. But I want to kind of approach this from a property testing, or at least from a generated perspective. So, of course, you know, in, in property testing world, we already have this test. We already have a test of generating random users over and over again, but unfortunately never found the, the case of any double L. But rather than changing the test or writing another test, let's leave the test alone and actually just change our generator. So let's, let's do something a little bit different and say, every so often, generate an L string. So the frequency will kind of say, like, every, you know, one time out of 20, Basically, generating with an L string. And so, even though we're only using gen user and you know, delete user, update user, migrate user, all those tests that we used earlier are all now using this gen user. We can now make sure that we don't just have this one bug in this place over here. We actually have guarantee that the bug doesn't kind of exist in any of the code bases anywhere. Okay, so that's the generators. It's worth, once you, you know, it's, it's worth investing in generators for, you know, building up the kind of the worst edge cases of your, your data type so that you can kind of read the benefits across all your tests. So, so I kind of want to talk, talk and finish up about a uh, thing called state-based testing, which is you know, really, really exciting, kind of almost cutting edge part of property-based testing, even though it's been around in some sense a long property-based testing. So I want to go back to um, this example that we had earlier. This is, a, this is a tripping test from before. So we're testing a database where we're inserting a user into the database and then getting it back out again. But of course, this is really only just the, the, the cusp of what you can imagine doing with testing like our like user table, for example. So you can imagine maybe we should actually test the fact that you generate two users, only one of them comes back so the ESPL is actually correct. Maybe we can say, well, now there's a delete user function, so now we're going to test that in some way. So tick one in there and make sure that you don't, you know, this, this in some way is kind of, you know, how many, how many examples is enough? How many of these property examples are enough? So this, this feels very familiar. So this kind of feels like the same problem we had earlier, which is rather than, you know, we were trying to, trying to kind of capture examples of the data, but now we're also talking about capturing examples of the actual series of steps that we want to call. So this is, this is, the, this is the idea behind state-based testing. Let's, let's get the computer to generate the sequence of steps that we run. So this is going to be, the code here is a bit more fuzzy than my other, my other stuff, but the, the general idea of this is that we model the state that we're trying to test. So in the case of a user table, let's just model it as a map of you know, user IDs to users. This is something as simple as that. And then let's model the different operations that we're trying to run. So we're going to model the insert that we're doing. And then, depending on your state-based testing library, it'll have a whole bunch of functions that you can implement for that command, like actually doing the insert, so actually running the database insert. It also has then a separate function, which is a way of then, you know, doing the in-memory pure state-based model version of that function. And then the important part would be the functionality. You run both these versions. You run the rule version, you run the model version. Do they line up? Is the system in a consistent state? And so when we do that again for research, we do that for get, we do that for delete, or any of the kind of operations that we're running from a testing earlier, you kind of wrap this sort of command operation style 
um, you know, model, models of other thing, and then the, the video exists now where we can then use our standard tools for property testing in the same way. So that's just what I generate. So we're going to say, using the Gen 1 of function, we're going to say generating a random operation, and then just generating a whole bunch of them random in sequence. And then any, the test may fail in, in a way like this. So then it says, well, after 11 tests, I generated these three steps. So I generated an insert, an insert, and a get, and it didn't behave in the way that I expected. Uh, apologies again, this is not a real example. This is not particularly useful, but you can imagine um, you know, it's actually finding real things. So in fact, I want to I want to show you a real use case of where this actually happened in the wild. So level DB is a, a key value store uh, from Google, and so I don't think it was someone from Google, but someone else went off and wrote a property test for this across like state based uh, test for it, and then came back eventually with this bug. So it found a series of 17 steps to reduce a really nasty bug in level DB. So, so this is, just to just point out, this is not 17 <coughs> random steps, this is 17 steps after shrinking. So you, you can imagine a whole series of steps that users would have done to actually reduce this bug, but the, the state-based property test found these 17, you know, very simple steps to actually say this is what happened. So then, you know, the guy could then raise a, an issue against Google saying you've got, you've got a bug in level DB. But my favorite part is that then, you know, Google went away for a few days and, you know, had a look at it, like, oh, that's actually a bug, we'll fix it for you, and then they came back with a new version. And then that same property, without changing any lines of code, then found another bug that took 33 steps to reproduce. So, um, you know, like, the, you didn't have to do any extra work, but the same property kind of reached extra benefit. But eventually, you will fix that one, and then the property, you know, ran 100 times, and it was fine. So, I think what's really exciting about state based stuff, apart from this is obviously pretty cool, but where the, where the icing on the cake is, is in fact, what is it we try to test? concurrent thread system. So, um, you know, writing concurrent code is really hard. It's really, really hard. Getting it correct is almost impossible. And then testing is, I don't even know how Google tests concurrent code. You know, obviously, it's, it requires a lot of work and, and you never really know if you get it right. Uh, if, you, if you use a state-based testing approach, um, some of the state-based testing libraries will then just give you this kind of function. So run that state-based test that I showed you earlier, we'll use a insert and get, and just crank up the number of threads and see what happens. And then maybe it comes back and says, well, actually, you know, maybe, maybe I did these steps. So what they often do is they'll, they'll, they'll generate a series of sequential steps and then run a whole bunch of them in parallel and see what happens and make sure that the, the post conditions all kind of pass. So this, this is kind of, I don't think this is my blog I'm really excited about this, this stuff. Uh, so this paper came, back, came out in 2009. So again, it's been around a very long time. And unfortunately, the parallel testing stuff is not in most of the property testing libraries, but I'm really hoping that you know, with the great interest in property testing arose, we can really start to invest in making this work. So it's in the Scala one, it's in the Erlang version, and now it's in the Haskell one, but we really should start to see more parallel testing in different property testing libraries. So just to kind of uh, finish up, just want to kind of walk you through what, you know, what we talked about. So we started with uh, the question, why do we test? What's the point of testing? Uh, and I kind of sort of you know, stated that hopefully we just are all on the same page here that we're trying to we're trying to write reliable correct code and that's the that's the aim. Um, but then the, the question becomes does does example based testing kind of like writing down hard coded examples and making sure we think about all those edge cases up front, we're really doing the best thing we can. Is, is example based testing really working for us? Why not get why not get the computer to basically generate these examples and see what we can do in that case? We saw the idea of fuzzing, so without knowing anything about the insertion of the, the test, without even knowing whether it's correct or not, let's just throw some examples of the code to see whether it breaks, and you'd be amazed what you can find just even doing this, like you know, null, null characters in your, you know, that aren't part of your database, um, even the maybe of you know, null point exceptions in one of the libraries you're using. Uh, we talked about the fact that when you actually try to write the insertion, it gets a bit tricky, particularly when you pass the exact inputs to your function, then how do you test it without just re reducing the function itself? We saw the, the power of the tripping test, so taking a function that goes from A to B, and then either writing or finding another function that goes back from the array again, and making sure the, 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 the value values are the same. So we saw that null character coming out, uh, we saw the over time bug. We also saw the error based testing um, sort of approach, where if you just find another way to get that same answer, then you've got a, then you've got a property test. And again, this is really, really good for whenever you actually try to do an optimization in code. If you're writing something that needs to be slightly faster, needs to mutate something, Go and write that other function and test it against those two because it will find it will kind of make sure you test that which it does. Um, I've already explained rebuild um, example where we sort of generate more inputs to the function we needed to then to make sure that we knew what the answer was going to be. We saw that 
probably testing my risk is shrinking. So even after a double that work to find that bad example, we then doesn't stop there and actually then tries to work out what the real, really kind of smallest possible case is so that you then go, well, this is a hard report for, for Google or this is, this is something I'm going to give to the person who actually writes this library rather than having to go and hunt for the, for the actual reason why it broke. We saw that investing in generators is really important. So having a generator that makes sure that the generator is the worst possible user is really important. And if you start to find regressions and things like nulls, you can then you know, you know, increase the coverage of your, your generator so that they cover all your tests. I got very excited about state-based testing, um, you know, where we're all dealing with very you know, complicated state-based systems, talking to databases, you know, you know, sort of all sorts of um, distributed systems that we're dealing with, and they all kind of have complicated states that we don't really test necessarily very well. So state-based testing is a really good way to use the computer to generate the different sequences of steps. So that's why I end on kind of a, a core arm series to say, well, since 1999, Chris Check has really, it's been around a while now, in some ways it hasn't changed a lot. Like, there are some definitely some tweaks on the ideas, but certainly the core idea of generating examples and writing assertion hasn't really changed since, since 1999. And so, you know, if you're at work tomorrow and you're writing some Java, there's no reason why you can't then just drop in your, you know, you know one property. Write, write a little fuzzer for that, that thing you're testing, see what it tells you, see what null points you, you know, you get from your code. If you're writing a JavaScript function and you, know, you want to make sure that, again, you're not getting under fines or all sorts of weird cases, just dropping in one property, you're not having to kind of rewrite or change language just to get the benefits of property based testing. Python has a particularly good, uh, well documented uh, library called Hypothesis, which is kind of fairly recently, which is really good. So if you're in the Python space, uh, this is a really good place to start using Hypothesis. Definitely one of the better property based libraries. So we, I guess hopefully people will kind of get a sense that I really think that by doing a property testing, by even just doing fuzzing, you can start to kind of see those edge cases in you know, not your code, because your code obviously works, but the library that you're using, the system that you're calling, things that you haven't thought about that your QA engineer is the one going to be telling you about, but instead you can see those errors when you write that code straight away. And I guess I want to end on the thing that, you know, it would be nice if we could sort of have our, our code be more reliable, more correct, by finding all these bugs up front rather than later on. We can do it without having to write all the code. We can write these really simple properties and then better testing than we are. So the last slide, just one of these ideas so people are interested. Um, particularly around the pattern stuff, if you're interested or you're trying to do your, your, your pattern, you're trying to write a property and you get stuck, this is the best reference guide. The FSHA for kind of profit blog post is just really in terms of like the, the round trip testing and the oracle based testing. I highly recommend reading that. It's really, really good. And there are basically references to this guide. Um, if, again, if you're at all interested in property based testing, you have to watch one talk from John Hughes. He's really, really passionate about property based testing, and they're all kind of the same idea. You're usually talking about state based testing, but this particular talk he uses that Volvo example, but he goes into more detail. And it's really, it's really mind blowing just how simple these tests are and just how complicated the bugs that he finds are. And then lastly, the, all the kind of um, you know, um, slides for the talk I hosted here, but also if you're in Scarlet, you can actually check out around the, you know, around the properties that way. So that's all I got. Uh, thanks for that. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Charles. We've got time for questions. Who has questions? Yes. I will run around. Thank you, Chris. Okay, uh, my question is, uh, if you look at it from the uh, test pyramid, right, the UI test pyramid, testing pyramid, UI unit uh, component that you can have in order. Where will this be used most of the time and where will it not be used? Um, that's, that's a good question. It's a bit hard to answer. In a way, but certainly UI testing, state based testing approach is really good. You can kind of model how you think UI is going to behave in a safe way and then you know, model the different interactions you do by clicking a button and, and so on. And then if you buy your state based testing, you're going to click a button and then drag a mouse and do all the things. Yes, you're here. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'm the mic. Um, yeah, so like for UI testing in particular, um, I, I think I mean, from what I've seen, state-based testing is a really good approach. So you can model your, you know, user clicks on this button, you know, user types in this particular input field, and then have your, your state-based test then, you know, randomly generate a sequence of the sort of user events. You can really test your UIs that way in a way that you wouldn't have to do manually. But that's the best example I've seen, but I'm sure that you also test different parts of your code with prop like sort of smaller properties as well. Don't have helps on that. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh, get it over here and then over there. Um, can you elaborate a bit more on how to identify the, the property? So I will be surprised to find a substring uh, property 
uh, how do we do this whole trace? Um, so that here. Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, this, this one's a bit tricky. I really, really, really wish I could start with a little bit more examples. Um, so the, the, the idea is you kind of need to, like, whenever you find yourself doing any kind of work on the right hand side, yeah, like, how would this, how this get easier to write? So, particularly this kind of test, if you're, so the other example I could be using is, like, let's say you're returning users with a database, and you want to find all the users by postcode, for example. Another example would be, um, Generate, generate two lists of users. Make sure that they're generating a random postcode and then assign the postcode to the first of the users. Insert both of the users into the database. So then you know the answer. You know the answer is going to be one of those lists, which is all users that have that exact postcode. So again, the answer should just be equal to something you know about those inputs. It's something you've generated. The idea is you kind of work back from a lot of, I've created a situation where I know what the answer is going to be. Work back from that and actually put to the test going to be or say something you know that kind of the output will be that and kind of do the logic again, if that makes sense. It's, it's a bit tricky, I guess it's very hard to, I'm hoping you know, you'll thought you might do, but again, you find yourself, the important part is you find yourself writing the, the code here on the right hand side, like the actual logic of the function, then take a step back and think, how do I, how do I know more about the system and like testing? I don't think it'll probably help, but I really recommend like, you just have to sit there, particularly go and look at that sharp block, it's worth, it's worth reading, and he has really good examples about, you know, what you do in a situation, what you do in a situation. Sorry, I can't answer that, it's just something you've got to kind of get used to. Something over, over this side there. Yeah. Thanks. Um, actually, the part is very similar to that one. Uh, it's related to this, this particular function. So in some things, because um, a lot of, in a lot of language, you can pass the negative numbers, and it feels like the kind of this kind of um, constructing the cases is more for the case where you know. You can you have control over both sides, yep. but the minus one or the more of those edge cases they can't be produced in this kind of um, straightforward methods. How how would that be? I, I think they can be a bit more properties. So this is where you definitely want more than one property. So you, you might write this exact property for positive numbers, and then you might do one for exactly the positive, just the negative numbers, where you might take the length of the string and you're minusing, and then it makes it, so maybe, maybe, maybe you can generate three strings and then make sure that you know the length of the last of the string and that's your minus number. So I think, you, I think you could do it this way, but just writing one property is not necessarily what you need to do, like sometimes you might want to have three or four properties that cover all the cases and you know that. So, uh, yeah, so, and it will still be under the sort of things that you know Yes. Yeah. 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 So there are there are some cases where yes, if you, if you can't write the oracle based test, if you can't do the invertible test, sometimes yes, you definitely have to come up with some edge cases. But now you're not coming up with three examples; you're coming up with the three things that will cover your code completely. So it's definitely like a in these kind of cases, it's definitely not one functional test for your entire thing, but the problem is definitely reducing the amount of code you have to write for those examples. Because you're really you're really describing exactly what the function does rather than just A B C one or A B C minus one. That's all you've got. You can now describe the, the behavior of what the minus one is actually trying to do. So you just you definitely need to write some more properties there. Yeah. Uh, Charles, thank you very much. Uh, you got me very excited about state-based testing. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, it's given me a way of testing my finite state automata. So that's very exciting. Um, 39 steps or whatever for the PDs and all that. So thank you. That's interesting. <laughs> The second thing is, uh, I'm not very troubled. I now know how to test my nice state machines. I'm trying to get you to give me a free literature search. Have you read anything in the literature about testing machine learning models? No, I haven't. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's a tricky one. I couldn't, I couldn't help you there much, I think. Yeah, because that doesn't give you a finite set of answers. No, no, and I think when we do machine learning stuff, we're too, and I think we like we definitely struggle with that style of testing. There's still, there's still plenty. Of, like, I think there's still plenty of room for different patterns and different approaches for those things. Yeah, that's, that's the question. Thank <laughs> you. Nice try. Um, any other questions? Maybe one more. <laughs> Behind me, there he is. Um, so I was. Just a little curious. Um, I was just wondering, what is? Uh, could you elaborate a bit more on your threshold for, say, deciding that something is satisfactory? That, yeah. 
satisfactorily tested? Like, at what point do you say, like, okay, I've done this enough, I've tested this enough, it's relatively bug free? Is there, like, a set of general criteria that you follow? Or is it, um, is it more flexible, is it more tailored to specifically what kind of thing you're testing? That's a really good question. Yeah, yeah I think, in some ways, maybe, in some ways, you can also say where the problem is. So, so, so the problem is a long time. We're never using our based testing or we're testing, testing or we're pretty much out of it. Like, you do the email one and maybe you test your test where the errors are going to happen, like, you know, your evaluation or something, but where things get tricky is the state based stuff. So, up until fairly recently, we haven't been using state based testing. So, that's where you go, and I've already got all those kind of cases covered. So, you might have 20 different copies that cover the inserting users with databases and things. So, I'm kind of excited as well to kind of try state based testing and see how many of those copies that don't have to write anymore. So, in some ways, it's a stage two kind of answer. Um, I certainly feel a lot better about properties than I do with the examples. Like I never knew this, never knew this stuff, but now with our properties, particularly again, vertical rules and oracle, you just write those and you kind of, you kind of cover it. Um, it's really only where you've got a lot of state manipulation and you don't have to know very well. I'm not sure they tested that early on that one. So, yeah, state based testing is awesome too. And if anyone else has questions, you can ask Charles after, but please join me in thanking him.